Happy Sabbath, everyone. Boy, yeah. Christian, you're getting to be so long and tall. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. You know, you have these young people here, and you know them since they're just little bitty things, little bitty things, and they just get bigger. But you know what comes with it? You're getting older, too. <laughs> And then eventually you'll re reach a spot like some of us that you quit growing up, you just start growing out. <laughs> uh, he keeps going, he, he may have to duck. But uh, let's have prayer this morning and we'll get, we'll get started. Father, we do thank you so much for this beautiful, this glorious Sabbath day. And as we gather here now to again study from your word, we just pray that you would bless us with the fulfillment of your promise that your spirit would be here to give us wisdom and guidance. As we open your word, we ask that you open our hearts and our minds, for we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the Bible, we find a lot of passages that talk about this thing called a judgment. A lot of people are confused about the judgment, what it is, when it is, where it is, all of these type of questions. And just about everybody you talk to is going to have a different idea pertaining to the judgment. But one of the passages I want us to begin by looking at this morning is found in Ecclesiastes. And here in Ecclesiastes, it says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is what? The whole, duty of man. the whole duty of man. Now, in the setting of this fear and reverence for God and the keeping of his commandments, he goes right on to say that God shall bring every work into what? Judgment. Into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So one day there will be a judgment and we will be accountable in that judgment for the things that we have done, whether we have treated um, one another properly, whether we've kept all of those commandments whether we sh as we should have, and how we related to God. And whether it was good or bad, all of these things will come in uh, into play in that judgment. And as we look about us, we have a lot of people that think that this judgment day is in the future sometime after everybody's dead. But the judgment day, my friend, is not something that is way off in the future somewhere. We're going to see today that the judgment is actually taking place now and has been going on for quite some time. The Bible tells us when the judgment began, and it tells us what event marks the end of that judgment. And we studied some time back in the book of Daniel. In the eighth chapter of Daniel, we've looked at chapter 2 and 3 and, and 6 and 7 and part of 8. And in chapter 8, we saw where, where Daniel saw this, this ram that had two horns, and it was coming from the east and all of a sudden as he beheld that he saw another creature and it was a goat with a notable horn between its eyes and if you remember that goat's horn was eventually broken off well these two beasts in this vision ran into each other and there was quite a battle and the goat prevailed over the ram and we studied that and we saw also in Daniel chapter 8 and verses 20 and 21, what the symbolism was of this ram and goat. Gabriel told Daniel, the ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. He goes on and he says, and the male goat is the kingdom of Greece, and the large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. So people have made a lot of speculations on this ram and goat thing. A minister some years back made a whole lot of money by selling a paper that said that the, the uh, ram was Iran and Iraq and the goat that came from the west and touched not the ground was western powers, the U.S. and, and uh, perhaps our allies having an airstrike against 
Iran and Iraq, and they build up all kinds of fanciful, speculative things in total disregard to what God had said through Gabriel to Daniel as to what was represented by this ram and goat. So this is simply a parallel with a little more information of what we saw in Daniel 2 with the arms and chest of silver and in Daniel 7 of the bear that raised itself up on one side and Medo-Persia as we saw ruled from 539 until 331 BC at which time it fell to the Greeks and Greece then ruled as portrayed in chapter 2 of Daniel um, by being the, the belly and thighs of brass and also in uh, Daniel 7 of this uh, leopard-like beast with four wings. Now watch what it said here in Daniel 8. It says, The great horn that was in the goat was broken, and for it came up four notable ones. Four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. So after Alexander, the first king, died, we have seen that his empire was divided between his four generals, Lys or Seleucus and Lysimachus, Cassander and Ptolemy. Seleucus and Ptolemy went on to become the kings of the north and south that you read about, especially in Daniel chapter 11. And so this was the vision that was there and it says in the latter time of their kingdom, the four divisions of Alexander's empire, the, a king of fierce countenance shall stand up. And we saw in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 that that next kingdom was the kingdom of Rome represented by the legs of iron and the dragon-like beast in, in chapter 7. And so now here, um, as uh, the, the last of these generals went down and the next empire came up, we find that Rome now ruled the world. Now, having seen all of this portrayed in Daniel chapter 8, Daniel fainted. It says, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. I was astonished at the vision, but no one understood it. So everything in that vision of chapter 8 was outlined to Daniel. All the kings and who was going to rule and what was going to happen to them. There was only one thing in Daniel 8 that was not explained before Daniel fainted. And that was verse 14. And in verse 14 of Daniel 8, it says, And he said unto me, For two thousand three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That was never explained to Daniel because Daniel fainted and there could be no further uh, information given on this prophecy. So Daniel had fainted wondering now what this 2300 days was all about. We've also studied and seen that a day in Bible prophecy equals a year. So 2300 days would be 2300 years. So Daniel now as we go into chapter 9, he fainted at the end of chapter 8. He's concerned about this 2300 days and so Daniel begins to pray about are the Jews going to be able to be released or will they be another 2,300 years in captivity there or 2,600 years or however long it was. How long before we get to go back home again? And so he begins to pray and I want us to pick this up in Daniel this morning. If you'll go with me to Daniel chapter 9, the ninth chapter of Daniel. And let's take a look here, beginning with verse 1. If you look up in verse 27 of chapter 8, you see where Daniel has fainted. Now in chapter 1, of, or ch verse 1 of chapter 9, he says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. So the prophet Daniel is now studying the Bible and he's studying the writings of Jeremiah. And he saw in the book of Jeremiah that Jeremiah had said that they would be released from Babylon after 70 years. To emphasize this, 
When the city was encompassed by the Babylonians, Jeremiah bought land in Jerusalem to show that he was planning on God's people being back there again. He knew he never would be. At his age, he'd be dead. But he still bought land that would go on to his descendants. And so he's studying the book of Jeremiah. He saw where they were only supposed to be there 70 years, and they've been there now almost 70 years. And so he said he set his face to the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Now he starts praying <clears throat> in verse 4. And this prayer of Daniel's runs all the way through this chapter until you get over to look at verse uh, 20. It says, And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplications before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. There's a bunch of them over here too. There's a, wherever you need to go. We got the bunches of seats. Okay, so he says, he'd been praying all the way from verse 4 to verse 20, he says, now, while I was in prayer about these things, all of a sudden, it says that Gabriel came. He says he's the one that he saw in the beginning, which vision was at the beginning. That's the last vision he had in chapter 8. You see, the, the, the chapter division is just there. It's a man-made entity. But it was there to help us find things easier. But the thought still goes on. And so he says, I was praying. Gabriel touched me about the time of the evening sacrifice. Now, when we look at this, we see that Daniel started praying. And in less time than it took him to pray 20 verses, less than 20, 16 verses, it says that Gabriel was there and said, at the beginning of your supplications, in other words, the minute you started to pray, the command came, uh, went out, and I have come to tell you. Now notice what he came to tell him. Understand the matter and consider the vision, it said. What vision? There's no vision here in chapter 9. The vision is in chapter 8, and it's going back to that vision of chapter 8, and the only matter that had not been explained in chapter 8 was the 2300-day prophecy. And so Gabriel there is explaining the 2300 days or years before the sanctuary is cleansed. So all that we're going to see from here on now is what that 2300 days was really all about. In Daniel chapter uh, 9 and verse 24, Gabriel said... Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy of chapter 8, and to anoint the most holy. Who was he? Jesus. So within this 2300 day period, all of these things are to be taking place. Ushering in everlasting righteousness, anointing uh, Jesus as the Messiah, and to establish this prophecy or this vision. So what we see is when it says 70 weeks are determined on your people, the word determined means to be cut off or set aside, separated from, and it was to be set aside for Daniel's people. Well, Daniel's people are the Jews. So within this 2,300 years, there is a period of 70 weeks or 490 years that are set aside within that prophecy specifically for the Jews and for those specific things to happen. Now, as I've said before, we've already studied this, but we know that this... The first part was 70 weeks or 490 years off of the 2300. What we've seen before is in Ezekiel 4, 6, and it's also in Numbers 14, 34, where God says, I have appointed you each day for a year. So 
Uh, 69 weeks would be 483 uh, years. 70 weeks would be 490 and so forth. So we're going to look at this very closely. The question is, though, when did these, uh, this 2300-year period begin? What was the thing that marked it so that we know exactly when to start it? Because unless we know when it began, we won't know when it ended. So in Daniel 9.25... Gabriel goes on and says, Now that know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the decree or the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Seven and 62 is 69, okay? So there's a specific period there that God is going to confirm his covenant with his people for this period of time of the 70 weeks, but Within that, there's 69 weeks that are set aside first. It goes on and says, The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. You see, when the Jews went back to rebuild Jerusalem with the decree of Cyrus, half of the people stood guard, while the other half worked on the wall. Because after 70 years, that place was all destroyed, and a lot of... Uh, unfriendly, to put it mildly, were in that area trying to stop the Jews from coming back in again. And so we see that there was going to be a command that was broken down into seven weeks, 62 weeks, and then one week at the end of this. This is a very important prophecy of Scripture. It took them seven weeks, or actually 49 years, to rebuild Jerusalem. That was the first seven weeks. Then after that, there's the other 62 after it was built that brought them up until the time that the Most Holy One, or Jesus, was anointed. And all of this will be laid out for us here. So the decree went forth. There was to be 483 years before the Messiah came. And so that's because it's 69 weeks, 7 days to a week equals 483 days or 483 years, okay? Um, if you remind me when I'm done, I think I have a book in the office that will have a lot of this stuff so you can read it. Because when you're doing a lot of math, it's hard to retain all of that in our minds. Okay, this decree, from the going forth of the decree or the command to rebuild Jerusalem, this decree was issued by Artaxerxes. And this can be found in Ezra chapter 7. Watch what it says. This is Artaxerxes' decree. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace, and so forth. I issue a decree that all those of the people of Israel and the priests and Levites in my realm who volunteer to go up to Jerusalem may go with you. So here King Artaxerxes gives a decree where the Jews now can leave Babylon, go with uh, Ezra back to Palestine and rebuild Jerusalem and reestablish their nation uh, there in Palestine, just as God had foretold it would be. So in an overview, according to Ezra here, the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was issued in 457 B.C. So now we have got a starting date. Historically, we have the starting date of when that decree went forth. From the decree to restore Jerusalem until the coming of the Messiah and his baptism or anointing would be 69 prophetic weeks or 483 years. So from 457 B.C., 483 years later, Jesus was to come on the scene after that period of time of 483 years. That happened in A.D. 27. In A.D. 27... Jesus went down to the Jordan to be baptized of John the Baptist. And he was anointed by the Holy Spirit, declared to be the Son of God, and began his ministry uh, at that period of time. Now the word Messiah is a Hebrew word, and it simply means anointed one. And it's, in, in Greek, the word is Christos. So it's the same thing, Messiah or Christos, and it means the anointed one, or we use it today just to say Christ. And uh, he was baptized 
and the anointed by the Holy Spirit. Watch what the Bible tells us. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, what year? Now the Romans kept meticulous records. And historically we can go back and see that the 15th year of Caesar Tiberius was A.D. 27. Now watch what happened. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened. So the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar was A.D. 27, and Jesus was baptized on time just as the scripture had foretold. Now watch what it goes on to say. It says that the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. He now went from there to begin the ministry as the Messiah. Mark puts it this way. It says, when Jesus went forth to begin his ministry, he said, the time is fulfilled. What time? The time prophecy of Daniel that he was supposed to appear on the scene in AD 27. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Everything in the life of Jesus had already been prophesied before he ever got here. Where he would be born, uh, that the babies in uh, Bethlehem, or the babies uh, in, would all be killed by Herod, that he would have to flee to Egypt. We could do a study later on that there's probably about 20 or 30 prophecies in the Old Testament that was fulfilled in the life of Jesus from the birth all the way to the fact that he would be crucified, crucified between two thieves, they would gamble over his garments. All of this, this, that one there in particular, was a thousand years before he ever showed up. So watch. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, and not for himself, and the people of the prince who, shall to, uh, who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and oblations. <clears throat> the prophecy said that Jesus now, once he appeared, would continue to minister there for one week. One week is how long? Seven years. In the middle of that week, he would be cut off, not for himself, but for us. And when he died, he was to bring an end to the sacrificial services. Now watch. These verses predict that the Messiah would die by crucifixion on the 14th day of the first Jewish month of the year of A.D. 31. And in the middle of the week, Christ, the Messiah, would cause the sacrifices to cease or to come to an end. We see in scripture that when Jesus died and cried, it is finished, that the veil in the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom, putting an end to the sacrifices because it was at the time of the evening sacrifice. And we're told in Mark that the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And so, that put an end to all of the sacrificial services. But people today think that the Ten Commandments were done away with at the cross. And I want to take a minute just to look at this today. Because people use these verses to try and justify disobedience to God. In Colossians 2, the Apostle Paul says that, that Jesus blotted out the handwriting of what? Ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, which are a shadow of things to come. Are the Ten Commandments ordinances? Were they handwritten? No. Yeah. And how did they get written? Finger of God. But the ceremonies and the ordinances of the sacrifices and all of that 
were written by Moses in a book and put beside the ark. Another verse people oftentimes go to to justify disobedience. It says that having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments. And they stop there. But it says commandments contained in what? Ordinances. Ordinances. If people would just read the context of what the Bible says and try, instead of trying to force their preconceived concepts upon the scriptures. And so what we see here is the 70-week prophecy began in 457 B.C., 483 years later, Jesus was baptized in A.D. 27, and now in A.D. 31, he is to be cut off seven years after. So this is what the prophecy is showing us. According to the prophecies of Daniel, God's covenant with the Jews would cease in A.D. 34. In A.D. 34, if you recall... The first Christian martyr was stoned to death, a man by the name of Stephen. And when Stephen was stoned, the, uh, there was a man standing there guarding the coats of the people by the name of Saul of Tarsus. And, and so Saul left the, the, the murder of Stephen, having taken part in it, on his way to Damascus to find some more Christians to kill. But on that Damascus road, Saul of Tarsus was confronted by Jesus of Nazareth. And the glory of that encounter put him right off of his horse, scared everybody else off. And Saul of Tarsus now became Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. And this is what God told him. Then he, that is Jesus, said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And Paul traveled all over that part of the world, ministering primarily to the non-Jewish population at that time. So that's an overview. Take a look at what we find here in Acts 13, 46. And when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with what? Envy. They were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas wax bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you but seeing you have put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life lo we what turn we turn to the Gentiles he said it was necessary that it be preached to the Jews first even after Jesus died why was it necessary because Jesus told him, I'm only sending you to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so for three and a half years after his crucifixion, the apostle still ministered primarily to the Jews. And he told them now, but you have put it away from yourself. You've rejected the good news of the gospel. And as such, you judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. And so we are going to go to the Gentiles. So in A.D. 34, Stephen became the first Christian martyr. The Jewish leaders rejected the gospel, and it went to the Gentiles, completing the 70 weeks or 490 years of probation for Daniel's people. So Stephen was the first Christian martyr. The Jewish leaders reject the gospel, and the gospel went to the Gentiles. So here we see... The decree went forth in 457 B.C. Uh, 483 years later, in A.D. 27, Jesus came on the scene as the Messiah. Three and a half years later, he was crucified. And three and a half years after that, Stephen, the first Christian, was martyred. So the first 490 years of the prophecy is now completed. And he said unto me, though, for 2,300 days... Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So even though the 490 years are cut off from there, we've still got more of the prophecy. The prophecy is 2,300 years long. So when would this cleansing of the sanctuary begin? What is this cleansing of the sanctuary that was to begin after A.D. 34 or 1,810 years after? 
Now mathematically, here's how we come to this. 2,300 years minus 490 years leaves 1,810 years, mathematically. Okay, so the last date that we have is A.D. 34. So you add the 1,810 years to A.D. 34, and it brings you to 1844, which is...